احمد هو وصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فقال عز وجل لقد كان لكم في رسول الله اسوه حسنه الى اخر الايه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب I would generally start off talking about the science of body language but instead of doing that I want to get into the topic itself and then come back to the philosophy and the ideas behind body language so that you can first of all begin to appreciate the subject and so I want to start off by talking about the first impression the first impression Imagine you know when we study the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we usually study the sunnah of the prophet fragmented like let me give you an example we study about the smile of the prophet and then we study about the handshake of the prophet and we study about his beauty but when you do clustering you're looking at the whole framework of what was happening all together for example when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would meet someone the smile would be there while he's handshaking right and so it when you take the different aspects of body language and put them together it gives you a much more holistic picture than looking at an individual sunna of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he used to shake hands like for example i'm sure all of you already know this and so i'm assuming a certain amount of knowledge when the prophet shaked hands we all know how he shaked hands and he would be the first one to shake hands and the prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam whoever is the first one to shake hands is the one who is closest to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also we learn something else here which is that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he would shake hands he would be the last one to let go for instance he would keep the hands on the shaking level and would not let go till the other person let go and this would be his sunnah but what does this tell us about him for another example is when the quran says abasa wa tawalla he frowned and he turned away but what is this body language of being frowning tells us usually when we say oh he frowned our impression of being frow- of frowning is that he was uh, upset but more than upset for example frowning has to do with sadness it's sadness more than being upset and so that's why we're studying the body language of rasulullah so that today we are going we're going to study a few things first we're going to study his first impression you know uh his first impression when you study his body language like when i'm saying body language remember this is something so powerful our bodies you know they are more our bodies tell us a lot about who we are okay and one of the amazing things jazakumullah khair one of the amazing things about human body language is this is that you can't escape the morality the morality that allah has put in our bodies you can't escape it if you're lying your body tells the others you're lying if you're happy your body tells others that you're happy even if you're trying to deceive someone in which i will talk about for example someone can learn body language like i know a little bit about body language and then try to fool someone using that science but people do this naturally like for example don't mind me saying this and sisters don't mind me saying this but one of the things we've discovered discovered is when women lie for example because they know women are more sensitive to their to their body reactions So when women lie for instance they'll appear to be busy not look at your face when they're lying to you okay so thank you jazakallah khair so women appear to be busy like you know they'll be reading through a book yes yes i did that yes yes you know so the point is is that that's their way of avoiding confronting someone what does it tell us to know that our bodies have a morality for example you can put someone on a lie detector right just like on the day of judgment allah says you know uh, uh, that our bodies will uh, will talk to and give witness against us in the same way we learn that our bodies they know what is right and what is wrong for example when it's someone is chi- when is someone is a child and they're lying inevitably they will take their hands towards their mouth okay and as you become a teenager you won't do that but you may like raise your hands close to your mouth because you've learned to deceive over time 
And what, what psychologists do is, when they're looking at someone's body, they're not looking for one sign. They're looking for two, three, like for example, if I'm shivering, one reason could be I'm nervous. One could be I'm cold. Shivering itself doesn't tell me anything about the personality, necessarily. I could be wrong if I say he's nervous. It could be he was cold. But if there are two, three signs, and you'll be amazed how many signs the body gives about itself. Now, let's come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What do we know about Rasulullah when he would meet someone? When you put it all together, when you put it all together, what is the first impression? The first impression, first of all, let me explain something to you about the first impression. People make a judgment about you the minute they see you in the first one-tenth of a second. In the first what? One-tenth of a second. So as soon as someone sees Rasulullah, they've already made a judgment about him. They've already what? They've already made a judgment about him. And then the next two to three minutes are spent in when you're engaging the person to, to try to classify the person in someone in your experience. Right? Someone in your experience, you'll, you'll meet someone, you have an impression. Now you're talking, and now you're just trying to think, okay, who is this person like from the people that I have met in the past? So you try to make association between this person and someone in the past. And then finally, you come to a solid conclusion that this person, I like this person, or I don't like this person. That means Rasulullah wasallam had to give a perfect self first impression to whoever he met right whoever he met because we find when people met rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam like i'll give you the hadith from sahih muslim amr bin as as he's dying he says this statement to his son you know he's crying and he's dying and he says you know when i was with rasulullah before when rasulullah was alive he said i knew at that time uh, that i was a good person Okay, and he says, you know, he's sorry. Amr bin As starts with his jahiliya period. So he said, I was the most person who wanted to kill Rasulullah. I was the most person who hated Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then I accepted Islam. And there was no one more I loved than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he says, then when Rasulullah left, then events happened, as we know Islamic history. Then events happened, and I don't know what my state is now, whether. I am going to go to Jannah or Allah is going to take me for a task. Because Amr bin As is a, you have to understand that Amr bin As is a heavy duty personality. He's like, in some ways we have Umar bin Khattab as you know, a very big and gigantic personality. Amr bin As is like this too. He is, he is the one, just so you know, just, you have some idea of his personality. He's the one, Amr bin As radiallahu anh, was the one who went to Abyssinia, when the companions of the Prophet migrated to Abyssinia, he's the one who tried to convince Najashi that let these people come back with me under my control so, because these are rebels from the people of Quraysh. And of course, Najashi didn't listen to him. But he was a master politician. This is what the Arabs, even if you talk to Brother Khalid, he'll tell you, Amr bin Asr radiallahu anh, he was known as a master politician. I'm telling you, this guy was what we call... Um, some people would call the alpha male. He is the man's man. Completely dominating personality. Right? Completely dominating personality. How dominating personality? You can understand from this riwayah. When Amr bin As became Muslim. That's okay. When Amr bin As radiallahu anh became Muslim. And he was about to give his allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Right? So he's about to give his allegiance to Rasulullah. And as he gives his allegiance, he takes his hands back. And he says, no, I have conditions. Okay? I have conditions. I will not give you allegiance of Islam until you accept my conditions. And so he mentioned one of the conditions he's met is that my previous sins being forgiven. And because this was a moment of... Uh, so the Prophet said, anyone who accepts Islam, his previous sins are forgiven. Anyone who does, you know, hajj, his previous sins are forgiven. So on and so forth. So the Prophet accepted his conditions basically. By the way, there are riwayat that not every person who converts to Islam, his previous sins are forgiven. There's also riwayat about this. But this is a secondary issue. What I want to show it to you is how dominating the personality of Amr bin Asr radiallahu anh was. And I chose his personality to make this point after, because I could explain how dominating his personality was. He says, 
And I'm not going to read the Arabic because I have so much to cover. Because I hope, inshallah ta'ala, you leave today with an exceptional, uh, exceptional appreciation for the first impression Rasulullah used to give to the people. So, uh, Amr bin Asr radiallahu anh, he said, and I'm just translating this, and this is uh, in Sahih Muslim, okay? And then there was no one as dear to me than the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one was more sublime in my eyes than he. So here's a man, dominating personality. What does he say? Never could I pluck courage to catch a full glimpse of his face. I could never look at Rasulullah and get a what? A full, uh, a full, full uh, uh, look at him with full looking. Okay? Due to its splendor. If I'm asked to describe his features, I cannot do that for I have not eyed him fully. This is, you, if, you, if you read Amr bin As's life, and then you look at this statement, you could not, like, it would look like a contradiction, right, Brother Khalid? It would look like a contradiction because this is, we're talking about a dominating personality. Think of Umar bin Khattab almost like. And this man is saying, and in fact, Umar bin Khattab was like this too. But, so Amr bin As is saying that I could not see Rasulullah wasallam with my full. So what does it, what's around Rasulullah? What is happening here? What is the first impression people are getting? I'm going to come back to this. But now the first thing I want to mention is there's something uh, in psychology called anchoring. Anchoring means when you anchor something, root something down. So anchoring is this. Now listen to what I'm saying. When you anchor something, I'm going to give you an example of anchoring. Somebody is sad. Let's say somebody is what? Sad. And this person is sad, and I don't want this person to be sad. So I go to this person, and I put my hand on his shoulders, right? I put my hand on his shoulders, and I say, it will be what? It will be okay. Okay? And I do the same thing repeatedly. I put my hands on the person's shoulder, and say, it will be what? It will be okay. Next time when I come and put my hands on the shoulder, I don't have to say it'll be okay. It's already registered in the person's mind that this is a comforting, uh, a comforting act from this person. Okay? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Okay. Now, just imagine at the very, even uh, leaving Rasulullah aside, this is what would happen if done properly from one Muslim to another Muslim. You know, how the Prophet, now just what is that? When you meet a Muslim, as Rasulullah would meet a Muslim, right? Sallallahu alayhi wa And this is something we're all lacking. But how would he meet a Muslim? How would he meet somebody? Number one, we know about Rasulullah, he would always have a smile on his face. Always. Right? Biwajhin uh, talaq. He would always meet the, everyone he went with a smile. Okay? And you know what? I will tell you about smile in a second. Uh, maybe I'll read uh, some stuff right now. Hold on. Uh, smile is one of those things that we have studied in detail. And smile is one of those universal emotions that all people have it. Every human being has it. And there are 17 different smiles. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. But what I do want to mention is this. Is that when you smile and if you're sad, guess what happens to you? You become you become happier. And if this other person is sad and you're smiling, what does it happen? What happens? He also becomes happier. And what is a handshake? What is, what is the purpose of, what does handshake do? What does a handshake do? Just to begin with, because I'm going to come back to this and go, go a little bit, little bit deeper. What does a handshake do? Handshake is an open hand to welcome someone. It's an open arm to what? Welcome someone. And so when you, when you are the first one to extend your hands, to shake hands, it means you're being very what? Welcoming. Now imagine that with a smile, right? A smile, a beautiful personality. I mean, we talk about, uh, and I want to make this clear, this is a good time to actually talk about this. There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Let the beard what? Grow. This does not mean the Prophet ﷺ meant let the beard grow even if it looks bad. In fact, let me make something clear. There, there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that says the beard of the Prophet was how long? Umar, uh, Abdullah bin Umar, 
who was the Sahabi who used to follow the Prophet by like hair, like just like exactly what Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did. Um, um, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an said in Sahih Muslim, the beard of the Prophet was a fist long. This is the reason Umar bin Khattab did this too. It's not just like Umar bin Khattab made up his own sunnah and he was following a sunnah other than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he says the same thing. In the Muslim of Imam Abu Hanifa, by the way, in the Muslim of Imam, Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Qahafa, who is Abu Qahafa, the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he says, the beard Asma radiallahu an, ha narrates the Abu Qahafa, that is the grandfather of Asma, says the beard of the Prophet was equal to an arm, a, a hand's length. And in the explanation of this, Qari Ali, Qari Mullah Ali, who is a great Hanafi jurist, he says, that the Christians, they shave their beards, and the Jews, they let their beards grow completely. We do what's in the middle. And in fact, he goes on to then say that we would know great scholars from not so great scholars by the length of their beard. Okay? So I'm not saying this is because there's obviously the hadith in Sahih Muslim in which the Prophet says, let the beard grow. And so some people take this literally and let it grow as much as... But the length, meaning the Prophet, when he said let it grow... He's saying it with his face, right? He's saying it with his face. So that meant that there is a certain length uh, of letting it go. But Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best. But the per- point I'm trying to make of this is that the Prophet would trim his beard. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would carry a comb in his pocket. The Prophet would have a toothbrush, the miswak, in his pocket. And the Prophet would have a mirror in his pocket. What does that tell you? And he's doing wudu five times a day. Right? And he would wear ithr. And ithr is one of those things, by the way, that has no, there's no israf in ithr. Because the Prophet would wear ithr with israf. Israf means over, overdoing it. It would be so much ithr that you could sometimes see the oil of the ithr on his face. It was like, you know, putting makeup basically, putting a lot of oil that you could smell it around him all over the place. And as you remember the famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet said, I love three things, right? That famous hadith. So, uh, and, and that's the, the, the good smell and women and a, the coolness of prayer. Now, imagine, so a person is going to make a judgment of Rasulullah how soon? Within one tenth of a second. And within one tenth of a second, a person is going to make the judgment is he like anybody? Uh, he, is this a person I like? And then he's going to look in his mind for the next two, three minutes as he's observing Rasulullah. He's going to think, is there somebody I know like him? Or there's no one I know like him. Right? That's the judgment he has to make. And so, in the first one-tenth of a second, you meet a person who shakes hands. He's the first one to extend his, what? Arm. He has a smile in his face. He smells good, looks good, gives an awesome first impression. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And that, that's just a part of, of, of what's happening, as, as you'll see. Uh, this is just a part of what's happening. But I want you to just look at this example. And, uh, and I want to uh, mention a few things. Number one, uh, let me just uh, talk about <coughs> uh, the this, this smile, uh, what we know about the smile. Uh, I'm just going to read to you something very interesting, inshallah. Smile. And make sure your smile is something to look at. Okay? We can identify a smile more easily than any other expression. A smile is the most easiest human expression to look at. Even from a distance of up to 300 feet, the smile is the surest way to guarantee a yes. From the first impression database scan. When you smile at another person, his mirror's neuron light, neurons light up and cause him to mimic that smile immediately. Yeah, smile is one of those things that's like a, like a laugh. Remember, if you're laughing and the other person doesn't even know why you're laughing, he'll also start laughing sometimes. Or if you're crying and they don't know why you're crying, babies do this. You know, babies, and this is one of the things, not modern psychologists, something our ulama say, that one of the reasons children get affected by human emotions like laughing. If you're laughing, the child will start laughing. If you're crying, 
Or if a child sees another child crying, the child will start crying. And from this the ulama deduced that a person whose heart is clean like a child, he gets most affected by the emotions of, of others. And this is what, when, why when Rasulullah wasallam would see someone crying, immediately because his heart was clean like a baby. His heart would be clean, so immediately he would get affected and he would also start to, he would also start to cry. Because his, 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 uh, his heart was clean like that. And, and, and you could tell the mood of Rasulullah wasallam basically by his face, which we will go into some detail about a little bit later. Anyway, so let me just continue. So smile is one thing that not only is, is it, it, it impacts not only you doing it, but it makes the other person what? Smile, right? And he may have had the worst day of his life, and he, he got a smile, but he doesn't know why. It's just happening subconsciously behind the person's mind. And when you're like doing so many things, right? Smiling, shaking hands, and looking good, you're anchoring. Remember the concept of anchoring I talked about? Is you're anchoring good feelings into this person. And that was the, the, one of the miraculous things about Rasulullah wasallam is that he would be able to take and make everyone feel so good. You know, there's a Sahabi, he says, each one of us thought the Prophet is our best friend. Each one of us thought the Prophet is, our, his, is his best friend because of the attention the Prophet gave, the way he smiled, the way he was the first one to grab a person's hands, the way he smiled, the way he talked, the way he listened, all of that was like, man, there's no one like this guy. This guy is like, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this guy is different. There's no one in my database like this guy, right? And no one in my first one-tenth of a second like this guy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obviously, when you study in the hadith of Shama'il al-Tirmazi, for example, the, the khuluq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obviously the Prophet looked very beautiful. I mean, this is one thing that we have to consider that how beautiful he must have looked or how handsome he must have looked for the type of the way he was able to win the people's hearts right obviously the way he looked had a big impact it wasn't a repulsive uh, sight it was a very welcoming sight okay and I'm going to talk about this uh, let me just finish about the smile So, when you smile at another person, his mirror, his mirror neurons light up and cause him to mimic that smile immediately. In some cases, even against his will. And once he has smiled, his body rewards him with neurochemicals of happiness. Physiologically, a smile tells our brains that we are safe and that we can relax. So when you smile, when these muscles move, they tell the brain what? You're... You're at safe, you're at peace. So when somebody has met Rasulullah, right, and he does it sincerely, right, and this is something we're just beginning to understand now, which is we've always studied the brain individually. But now we're beginning to study the brain, how the brain works when the brains are working collectively. And literally, there's this thing that he's talking, he's calling it mirror neurons, where uh, there's like this Wi-Fi, literally, that goes on from one brain to another brain. Scientists aren't sure if it's really Wi-Fi or it's through the eyes or how it gets registered. But exactly what, what one person does affects how the other person reacts, even in body language. And there's this silent... You know, you say so many things in words, but a lot more is said in, in actions, right? And the body is reading both the words as well as the actions. Okay, so let me just sit down for a second. Uh-oh, subhanAllah. Uh, Okay, so, so it, in some cases, even against his will. And once he has smiled, his body rewards him with neurochemicals of happiness. Physiologically, a smile tells our brain that we are safe and that we can relax. So when we smile at others, they see us as open and approachable and automatically receive a message of trust and sincerity.
the smile is perceived as the most genuine will. Uh, okay, this part I'll come to later. This is a little bit more complicated. I'll come back to this. But generally, now one thing that Muslims should learn in America, because we are under the microscope and people have so many trust issues with us, right? Two things. Muslims, every Muslim, forget about doing da'wah and forget about, uh, you know, trying to convince people of Islam. To start with, every Muslim should do two things. Number one, identify yourself as a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. This is the first thing. Second thing, identify yourself whenever you meet any non-Muslim with a smile. These two things, if you just do these two things, you know, just these two things, letting other people know I'm Muslim, and then whenever you meet people, meet them with what? A smile. It will give them a sense of comfort, a sense of trust about you, and they ident- and make sure that they identify you with you being Muslim and Islam. And this, if you know, because people sometimes they think, okay, how am I going to convince people? Even if you can't do that, I know I've worked in corporate America. That's very hard to do in that type of environment. And so what you could do are these two very basic things: give a strong handshake. Smile and let people know you're Muslim. And they will know, they will automatically subconsciously feel that what is it about this person that's different? Why is he, every day, you know, depression's an epidemic, right? Depression in America is ep- epidemic. Prozac and all these different drugs are at their highest level of sales ever. And so when people will meet you, right, and you smile and, and, and you shake good hands, and they know you're Muslim, and that they know you're different, and you're still smiling. See, this is the thing. When you're different, you shouldn't be smiling. You're different. But when you're different, and people see you're different, and you're smiling, and you're welcoming, and you're trusting, then, you know, that leaves like an impression of, wow, that's, that's quite interesting. That's quite different. Now, what's the second thing Rasulullah did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He used to shake, what? Hands. Now, shaking hands is a very important Thing. Let me just uh, mention something very interesting in terms of body language. Even people who have studied body language have studied body language to the point they know shaking hands between a guy and a girl is not natural. So I'm going to read to you what this uh, author has said. It, it just doesn't happen because you know where girls, girls don't even, most, not most of the time, a lot of times, in the natural state of the world, meaning one is if you're shaking hands with a girl all the time, she knows that a handshake is going to come. But in the natural way, girls are not, they don't even look in the direction of the smile. And they'll usually let, leave the guy sh- his hand just in the air. So I'm just going to read to you, some, one author is writing about what to do because this happens. It's not natural for girls to shake hands with guys. And so they usually miss it. And so how not to look bad? If you do miss, if that happens to you. I'm just going to sh- read this to you. The point of this is not to discuss women shaking hands with men. The point of this is to, is to establish two things. This is a side point. And number two, to also the teachings the Prophet has given us about body language, how that uh, has an impact. So even though women have a strong presence in the workforce for several, several decades, many men and women still experience degrees of fumbling and embarrassment in male-female greetings. Most men report that they receive most what? That they receive some basic handshake training from their fathers when they were boys. But and, and it goes on. As adults, this can create uncomfortable situations when a man reaches first to shake a woman's hand, but she does not see it. She's initially more intent on looking at his face. A girl naturally looks at the person's face. If she's interacting in the market, right? Or she's interacting in business, Right? Even though Islam tells us to keep the eyes down. But the ulama have talked about like the exceptions. And one of the exceptions is like when you're having a business contract, so on and so forth. Okay? Min abusarihinna. Min abusarihinna. Yani minha. Laysa kulluha. Yani juziyan. Laysa kulliyan. So the point I was trying to make is that min abusarihinna. That part, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this in the Arabic language, the Quranic text is saying that they lower their eyes. The Quran doesn't say fully lower their eyes. Okay? Not all the time. But min abu a part of their eyes, in certain, in this proper circumstances, their eyes should be lowered. But if you're like walking in a street, 
It shouldn't be so lowered that you, you know, hit something, for example. So you have to use a little bit of common sense when you want to show modesty. And especially, uh, there's rulings about, for example, if a girl is in niqab, right? And uh, that the girl is allowed to, in mo some cases, look. And the guy is not. But anyway, these are other uh, situations I won't go into right now. I just want to read what this is being, what's being said. A man reaches first to shake a woman's hand, but she does not see it. She's initially more interested on looking at his face. Feeling awkward with his hand suspended in midair, the man pulls it back, hoping she didn't notice. But as he does, she reaches for it, and, so, and, and is also left with her hand just dangling in the middle. And it continues, okay? The point was that it's, not, it's very natural for men to shake hands, uh, universally. Handshake is one of, it's just like a smile. Univer, you, you, a smile is a universal emotion. And handshake is a universal gesture that's done by all cultures, period. All cultures do this. Uh, the reason this is important, if I can now go into this a little bit, I will tell you why it's important to talk about this. The reason this is important is because modern psychology for the longest time said that man is a byproduct of his environment. And that meant that people in America have one culture and our body language is different. People in Japan have another culture, their body is different. And the people in Pakistan have their own body language because they come from a different culture. And so there's nothing dispositional about, there's no fitra, basically, is what, what, what classical psychology teaches you. You are more a result of your environment than you are a result of your disposition. But as time is going on, we're learning that the genes, you can say, or the human disposition plays a greater and greater role in defining who we really are. And it's universal throughout all the cultures. So I just want to, regarding that, share with you one thing that's very interesting, if I can find it here. <clears throat> yes. Yes, 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 I, I remember reading that. Um, I'm just going to show you this chapter because I don't want to go through the whole chapter. But this is called, this is a book called Destructive Emotions. Okay? And it's a pretty interesting book. Uh, it's a very interesting book. And one of the chapters is the universal, universality of emotion. Everyone experiences happiness, sadness, so on and so forth, terror. Everyone has the same emotions regardless of what culture they're in. And our body reacts to those emotions the same the same way. And why is this important for a Muslim to know? Because, or why is this important for anyone to know? Because this establishes that we have a, not only do we have a moral aspect, but we have common emotions throughout the world. So the emotions the Prophet was talking about in the Arab world apply not only to the Arab world, for example. The teachings of Qur'an are not only for the Arab world, but therefore, because Islam is talking about a universal message, and even though it comes only from the Arab world, it doesn't mean that it applies only to the Arab world. It can still apply to the whole world because human nature is the same. See, if human nature was changing based upon context, if human nature was changing based upon, if I'm in Pakistan, I have one human nature, and somebody's born in America, he has a different human nature, and somebody somewhere else has a different human nature, then you can say, well, somebody coming from the Arab world, how can he be a role model for me? Okay. But when we learn that human emotions are basically the same and the, the, they express themselves the same way, right? Then you know that a man who is from even the Arab world, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he can be a role model for anyone in the world. Okay, so this is very important from this perspective. And this is a big deal, this is a big change in psychology because up till the 1990s they were like dead hard about Everything is cultural. Everything is cultural. Everything, Freud's superego is the result of the culture. Every, everything is culture. And the Prophet has talked about the effect of culture. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulu, kulu ala fitra. Everyone's born on fitra. And then the, the parents, they change the child. So your, your, your environment affects you. But the fitra is always there behind the scenes. The fitra is there always, what? Behind the scenes. You may have changed 
your uh, uh, fitrah. From, you may do something that's not according to the fitrah. But the fitrah is always there. The human disposition is always there. Okay. So I want to now go on to the second part, which is... So then, let me just uh, read to you this now, uh, which is the power of the... You can say the awe of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I just want to... Uh, this is just a side point. We already know this. This is common sense. But however... I thought I should... Uh, what does it mean when Umar bin As says... We're talking about first impression, right? He, his impression is so powerful that, that of course he's giving a great impression by his smile, by his handshake, by the way Rasulullah looks. But really, what is the effect? Something's there that causes the effect to be like this. Umar bin As says what? That I could not even look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Umar bin Khattab was just like this. For example, I'll mention to you, Umar, of course, the Surah Al-Hujrat already says what? لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي Do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whatever voice level the Prophet was talking at, everyone else was talking at a lower voice, even to the point Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh would take, be careful of this ayah even in front of the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would even keep his voice low when he would be near the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Just to give you an example, and of course, all the Sahaba applied this. So when they went to an atmosphere, right? They're around Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not only is the Prophet welcoming you, but everyone's talking at a lesser voice than him. Everyone's talking less than him. Also, everyone's also what? Talking less than him. He's the only one who is really talking, right? Or that's maybe not put in the best way. He's the only one who is, who everyone is looking for instructions from. Put it that way. That's actually, because it's not like the Prophet was rambling. Most of the statements of the Prophet are just a few words. But everyone's looking up to him. Right? The Prophet even asks something, people are replying back, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam, Allah and His Messenger know best. Right? So now imagine this scenario where the Prophet is so welcoming to the individuals, but the collective has this like adab towards Rasulullah What type of atmosphere that creates? So now, now Umar bin As can't look at the Prophet. And what does that tell us about Rasulullah? And by the way, this is not only the Umar bin As, I only chose him because of the type of personality he has. This fact that when companions looked at Rasulullah they never felt they got a full of him or they never could look at him directly. This has been reported by many of the companions Ka'ab bin Malik, so on and so forth, have, have mentioned this at one level or another level. What does it mean that they couldn't meet uh, Rasulullah eye to eye or look at him completely from a body language perspective? What was their effect of seeing Rasulullah is what I'm talking about. So I just want to uh, mention here, as a sign of submission, when you look away from a person, okay, it means when you can't look at a person, it means you are giving away your power and submitting to that person. That's what it means. When you, when you, you, know, in, uh, you know in the Eastern cultures, like in the Indian culture, the Pakistani culture, we have this, when the teacher's yelling, we say, keep your eyes down, right? But we force it. We teach it by what? Forcing it. They're doing this to Rasulullah out of a natural reaction to Rasulullah. You see the difference? So, keeping your eyes gaze low is an indication of submission. Okay? So, Amr bin As is saying in this hadith, when you look at it from that perspective, that we love Rasulullah and we trusted him so much. Right? We basically, there was so much trust of Rasulullah. This is the point where you can understand more, you can't understand this in words. When you look at the wordings of the Sahaba and the Prophet, you don't understand that they were trusting Rasulullah. It was like they, they handed over their life to him. It was like they handed over every decision of their life to Rasulullah. Nowadays, when we have any issue, we go to the Mufti, right? For every, and there are people who go to the Mufti for every small reason, right? But with Rasulullah, it was the same thing, but at a much higher and much more dignified level that they weren't asking every little question. But every pertinent question, every complaint, every major complaint, every issue, it was like they trusted Rasulullah They handed themselves over to this man, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and 
when they saw, now you imagine somebody comes in, right? And everyone is in silence waiting for your next words, next instructions, right? And, and now you come in, you're a nobody. And here's somebody everyone's respecting so much, right? You're, you're a nobody. This is why you can now imagine why Umar bin Khattab would say so many times, okay, Rasulullah, give me permission, I'm just going to take care of him, right? Can you, you can imagine that in that state that I'm talking about, that somebody who disrupts that atmosphere, it was like, okay, we need to take care of you. So when, uh, when somebody who is not part of the circle comes in, and there's this aura, there's this honor, right? There's this dignity, right? And there's this trust with the Rasulullah and this man comes in, no one knows him, and the Prophet greets him like he's like the most important person that's in that crowd. That gives like such a, a, a powerful impression. So this is part of what we understand, a part of what was happening in the time of Rasulullah Let me just uh, take another sip and then I will continue. So, let me just uh, go over this thing. This is very important. I'm going to read this very quickly. This has to do with first impressions because that's what I want to concentrate on today. The snap judgment, right? They make a judgment about you in the first one-tenth of a second. I'm just going to uh, read this to you very quickly. I shared the shocking fact that within the first one-tenth of a second of seeing your facial features, which one? And if you look at the hadith literature, which part of the Prophet's body is talked about the most? It's his face. His color of his face changed, for example. Right? We saw the molar teeth of the Prophet ﷺ. Or we saw him smile. Or we saw him cry. There is a lot more ahadith talking about his what? His face. There was something about the Prophet's face that as soon as you saw the Prophet, you were magnetized to his... Something about his face. How his face looked. And when we talk about what makes a beautiful face, inshallah we'll do that. What is the concept of beauty? What makes beauty? And then when we talk about Rasulullah, you'll see all of that. Uh, That guy you just met has already made a judgment about whether or not he's attracted to you. If he can trust you, how competent you are, or even if he will take you as a person. If you give him half a second, or even a full second, those judgments would remain the same and just become more solidified. Okay? Your entire shot at a job, the account, the account, the date, over in one-tenth of a second. Most people can't even blink their eyes in that amount of time. All this occurs before you open your mouth to say a word. Okay? And then he goes on to the different studies. Professor such and such did the studies. I won't go into that. And then, this is the part, okay. Given that attractive people, attractive people, right? People that look good. And in fact, you know, in the Hanafi fiqh, I don't know how many people know this, it's very interesting. In the Hanafi fiqh, when they're discussing who leads the prayers, so considering there are two imams, equal. Equal in knowledge, equal in recitation, equal in every way, okay? Equal in giving khutbah, equal in trust. The, the next thing that they look at is how, who is of the two more beautiful? And whoever is more beautiful, he should lead the prayers. This is just a legal procedure. It's not what really happens. But they establish a legal procedure to... To, to, do, to do this. Uh, given the attractive, people tend to have better careers, even earn more money, have higher social status than less attractive people. It's no wonder we would all like to be attractive. But what does that actually mean? Research tells us that for women, attractive uh, equals such and such and such. I won't read that. Uh, and then this part about beauty I'll go into later. But the point is, is that attract, the Rasulullah was very what? Attractive. And the point that everyone universally looks at 
when it comes to beauty is which part of the body? Everybody universally looks at the face, right? There are other parts of the body, different cultures now look at different parts of the body. But everyone universally looks at what? At the face. So the face of Rasulullah was impeccable, basically, was perfect. Right? And this is why they have used such poetry and such, you know, such, so much ahadith. In fact, there's a ch- chapters and chapters on just describing how Rasulullah looked. And most of that time is spent on describing how his face looked. Now, the other thing I want to mention with this is this. By the way, I want to mention something as a side point. Uh, sometimes Muslims, they also do handshakes. But, there are certain handshakes that are not good, and I don't think Rasulullah meant to do that type of handshake. Sometimes people do a handshake, we call it, I think, we call it vice handshake. Okay? And vice handshake is a handshake that when you, you, see, the whole point of shaking hands is to show how welcoming you are. Remember? Okay, so when you shake hands with someone, and your hands are completely lifeless, have you ever sh- shaken hands with someone whose hands are completely life? There's no life in them. Okay? There's no life in them. There's no power in them. There's, there, it's, just, it's just like a, it's like a, it's like a limb that's just hanging. Okay? I mean, it's funny, but there are people like a limb that's hanging. That is, a handshake tells you a lot. I mean, the handshake is one of the first impressions about you. And so somebody gets this hand and it's like a limb. It's, it, there's no life in it then a very negative impression happens because of that. A Muslim should shake hands with like, he should put all his heart into that hand and saying, Assalamu alaikum, you know, in a way that he really means that dua, and, and, and it should really be a, a lively like handshake. And, and actually, psychologically now, people that give hands that are like a limb hand, do you know what that means? That means that they're submissive personalities. Originally, the handshake, even though it's a universal human gesture, it's a universal human gesture, but handshake is to actually, it's to welcome the people, but handshake also serves to show how uh, active you are, how, how powerful you are, how dominant you are, right? And when you shake hands with someone with a limb, your hand is just there, not doing anything, right? Just like, it's like a dead part of your body. Literally, this is how, I'm not using these words, this is how psychologists use the words. They describe it as like, it's like a dead limb, that's what they say. It hangs there like a dead limb. Then that person has severe psychological problems, because that person who shakes hands like that, really uh, is a person who is very submissive. And he's only shaking hands with you, or one of the only reasons he's shaking hands with you is because he doesn't want to, to offend you. It's, it leads to a disease we call people pleasers. They do everything because they're in a submissive state and they do everything just to please everyone. And so let me just actually um, read to you something about that uh, just so that uh, I can make my point a little bit uh, better on that point. This quietly persuasive style Okay, the palm is presented in a down position with one one sharp downward bump followed by two or three vigorous return strokes and a grip that can even stop uh, Okay, so he's talking about the other person but basically the person who hands this he's talking about the fact that business people love this handshake because they know the person is going to do what to them? Surrender to them. Right? So you see a person like that and you want to do business, you say, hey, buy this for me. He'll say, okay. Even though he doesn't want to buy it because he's a people pleaser. Okay? So for business people, they get a shake like that, they're like, okay, this is a perfect target. Okay? Uh, okay. So I will... Oh, the one thing... Uh, let me see if I have that here... Uh, I wanted to talk about the 
Now, this is another study. I'm just reading this to you very quickly, and then I'm going to go on to the next. How much time do I have? 15 minutes. Okay. The remarkable thing about a smile is that when you give it to someone, it causes them to reciprocate by returning the smile, even if you're both using fake smiles. Okay. And this person in Sweden, this professor, uh, Elf uh, Dimberg in Sweden, conducted an experiment that revealed how your unconscious mind exerts direct control over your facial muscles using equipment that pick up electrical signals from muscle fibers. He measured the facial muscle activity in 120 volunteers while they were exposed to pictures of both happy and angry faces. They were told to make frowning, smiling, exceptional, uh, expressionless face in response to what they saw. So they're seeing someone, someone's happy, they're being told to you know, mimic it or do the opposite of it, so on and so forth. Sometimes the face they were told to attempt was the opposite of what they saw, meeting a smile with a frown or a frown with a smile. The results showed that volunteers did not have real control over their facial muscles. When they looked at a cer certain person and it was a sad face, that made them subconsciously sad. So even if they tried to smile, they couldn't smile. That's how powerful. It's a very basic thing. And so the homework for all of us in this class is that we will master <laughs> smiling, <laughs> right? Because that's something that I think I can use help on. And I think that's something that we can all use help on. And this will be something that will make us all happy people. And then, you know, it has good results. And then uh, another in, uh, professor, Roth Campbell from University College London, believes that there's mirror neuron in brain that triggers the part responsible for the recognition of faces and expression and causes an instant mirroring reaction. In other words, whether we realize it or not, we automatically copy the facial expressions we see. This is why regular smiling is important to have as part of your body language repertoire, even when you don't feel like it, because smiling directly influences other people's attitudes and how they respond to you. Now, why is, this, why, am I, why is this interesting to me? It's interesting to me because Rasulullah was sent as a messenger. And as a messenger, it was his responsibility to convey the message. So in his body language, he left no aspect of his body language, right? That would make a person not want to listen to him. That would make a person what? Not want to listen to him. From here you can, because it was his, his responsibility to convey. And they make a decision in the first one-tenth of a second. This is perhaps one of the reasons. When Rasulullah had a body language in Abasa wa Tawalla, he frowned, that had an, a body language that was, you can say, even though the Prophet wasn't doing it to the kuffar, he was doing it to, he was showing his anger to a Muslim. And when the Prophet has shown his, you can say, he's upset to Muslims amongst Muslims, the Prophet has never been said, why were you angry? But because he was engaged in da'wah, at that moment that he was engaged with da'wah, and he showed signs of, let's say, weakness in da'wah. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, don't, you shouldn't have frowned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Especially at that moment, because people get affected by your every, every expression. And to get affected by the expression of Rasulullah in any way negative, right, would cost his work of da'wah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the reason, right, not because Allah is upset with Rasulullah, but this affected his effectiveness as a muballigh, as somebody who is supposed to try to com convey the message of Islam. Okay, and of course this is with all due respect to our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... Uh, Okay, so I will just uh, um, stop here for now. Okay, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about, and I'm going to go into more detail about first impressions, but I think I gave a good, a, a quite a good en enough of information for you to begin to sense how powerful the first impression of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was from everything from the first moment they saw him to how welcoming he was, and about being welcoming, by the way. I mean, the Prophet was so welcoming. For example, we know in body language, we know to point fingers, right, is a very negative thing. We know this through, through research, and I'll read the research to you later. The Prophet never pointed fingers, by the way. He never pointed fingers. 
You know what the prophet did? The prophet showed the entire hand, the whole palm. He communicated with his whole palm. Usually he wouldn't compare, uh, communicate with part of his like fingers. He would com- and we know in, in psychology, we know that when, usually, this is universal. This is one of the other universals of body language because there are things that are contextual based upon culture and then there are those things that are universals. One of the things that's universal is that when human beings show their, this side of their hand, it's usually positive. And when they show this side of their hand, it's usually negative. Okay, so all the, the bad things come from this side and all the positive things come from this side. And whenever Rasulullah s.a.w. gestured, he always gestured like he was, because the Prophet did gesture. But whenever he did gesture, he would gesture with his entire palm, what? Out. And you know what that is? Just like a handshake. A handshake shows that what? I want, if you're the first one to extend your hand, it shows you're willing to welcome the person, Right? It's also a form of opening your hands, by the way. And, the, and so when Rasulullah would show his hands, how do you surrender, for example? How do you surrender? By showing both hands. So when you, when you talk to somebody and you use both of your hands, it's like I'm surrendering to you. I don't mean to offend you. I don't mean to hurt you in any way. I'm open. I'm open to whatever you want to say to me. Right? It's like opening your personal space up. Uh, everyone has a personal space. Right? Where they feel like, oh, this guy is too close to me, you can say. Some people have less, some people have more, but everyone has a personal space. But when you do this, you're telling the other person that I'm opening up my personal space, I'm opening up the doors of communication, definitely try to communicate with me. Right? And so this uh, is very important when you consider the job of Rasulullah being the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he was a muballigh. And to be a muballigh, he had to be the best what? Communicator. Balagh means to communicate. And so there can be nothing in the body language of Rasulullah that opposes good what? Communication. There just can't be. And if there is a contradiction, then that would be a problem. And there can never be a contradiction because he was Rasulullah. And so whenever he would talk, in fact it was so much that when we study two things, I'll give you two examples. When we study body language about the hands, right? Again, hands is one of those major parts of the body that, that has a big impact upon the others. The face is another example. It has a big impact. When you even... Okay, so this is open hands, right? But now uh, there's another thing. Suppose this is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. This is also in the Shema'il al-Tirmazi. When it said, when the Prophet would be asked a question... And he wouldn't know, right? He wouldn't know what's the answer to this. You know what his body gesture would be? Look, he doesn't know. What does his body language tell us? He would do this. He would take his hand like this and do this. And we know in, in, in studies of psychology, uh, I, can, I can show that part to you, but when people turn their hands down, it's negative. And to show authority. Like if you say like this, what does it mean? Like quiet down, right? When people turn their hands this way, it means I want to understand. I'm open to you. Same thing. So when the Prophet wouldn't know an answer to something or he found something strange, like how is that? We even do this in, in, the, in the Desi culture. I know we do this. This. Right? What is that? What is that? It means you're open to receiving an answer. What is that? You know, what does that mean? And so the Prophet would turn his hands. Like his hands would be like this. He would turn it like this. He'd say, what is that? Tell me what that is. And so the Prophet was open to receiving an answer. He wasn't faking it. Is, is the point. And, and so, even study another thing, is that the, the palm had to do with the idea of giving bayah, right? So the Prophet would take bayah with his hands open, right? If he was exerting authority, if you remember Hitler, one of the people that they've studied in, his hands were always like this, because he was trying to show what? His authority and power. Okay? When Rasulullah was taking allegiance from the people that you will join hands with me, he didn't do it like that. He didn't give the bear. He took the bear. Right? He was showing them, I'm open to you. Come to me. Okay? The person that's giving the bear is the one who feels like he's gaining something. Right? Even though he's surrendering to Rasulullah in a way, but psychologically, in terms of body language, it was Rasulullah saying, I'm open to you. And you joining me, I see it as you are helping me, right? I'm giving you authority 
and giving you the ability to do what is the last part of most of the bayas, they would say this, and that is, an aqulu bil haqqi aynama kunna. We will say the truth wherever we are. La nukhafu fillahi lawma talaim. We will not fear the blame of any blamer. So the Prophet, the Prophet was empowering them, right? And while he was actually taking authority, but in, he saw it, he saw it, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw it as a way of empowering the other people. Okay? How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, I think we can end here for today. Uh, if anyone has any questions. You see why? I mean, I know people were saying, why does Omar want to talk about body language? But do you see why it's so important? To, to, because you can really visualize. You, you can study the smile of the Prophet, but it's separate from the handshake of the Prophet, which is separate from how he looks. But when, you, when you're looking at body language, you cluster the features. You cluster the smile with the, with the handshake. And you cluster both of them with his whole look, right? And so we learned something about the personality of the Prophet, which is what? Everything about the... the, the he had an awesome first impression. He was very open to people, right? He was willing to do whatever it takes to bring people into his personal space, right? And he did not... He never did anything to... In, in terms of his fitrah, in terms of his body language, he generally at least did not do anything to push people away. He was always willing to accept people, come to my personal space and talk to me, l- learn from me, ask me, so on and so forth. <laughs>